Morning friends, welcome to my channel. My name's Justin. I play guitar on songs in Nashville. Today I got a treat for you. This is an overdub sessions video that I filmed a long time ago and never got around to posting. So you get to see me with far shorter hair and uh, maybe a little less in shape. <laughs> uh, probably not as drastic as I would hope as much as I've been working out lately. Um, but yeah, I, I filmed this about a year ago, and it's basically doing some fills and kind of a lead track on a song that's very bluesy in nature for a record that I produced. And it's been out for a while, so I'll have a link in the description to the finished product. Um, but basically, I'm, I'm tracking two passes on this song. One is with my 335 through my old deluxe reverb, and these are... Uh, this track is basically the the fills and stuff that kind of goes around the vocal. And then I split a solo with the B3. Um, the other track is with my rubber bridge guitar, and I plugged it in as well and used it through the Deluxe Reverb 2. So that one's harder to hear. It's just so dark. Um, and that, that's kind of the, the reasoning for the track. I wanted it to kind of be, you know, back in the mix, not something that really draws a lot of attention to itself. Uh, but it still sounds super cool. The the humbucker that Sam, the guy that built my rubber bridge guitar is Sam Hoxley, who's a great guitar player. Um, and uh, he puts these really high output humbuckers in the neck position of his, his rubber bridge guitar. So I'm using that straight into the amp. And uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty dark, but it's still cool. Um, one one little heads up I wanted to give you all. This footage that I'm about to show you is from before I got a decent camera rig. <laughs> so it's, it's literally the uh, front-facing camera from my iPad. And you can see like the iPad fisheye lens and, and whatever. And the audio that you're hearing is what's coming out of my monitors into the internal mic of the iPad, which was set up like right over here. Uh, when I did it, but um, the song is really cool. I really like the parts on it. Uh, the band from that record was so good. Um, Jason Cheek on drums, Craig Young on bass, and uh, David Dorn on keys, and Gordon Moat on keys as well. We had two keyboard players and one guitar player. That's a little backwards for this town. It's usually two guitar players and one one guy covering all the keys stuff. So. Anyway, um, I also, uh, I have a new mug. If you want to support the channel, get an Overdub Sessions mug. It's really, it would be really highly appreciated. Help me feed my kids who are bottomless pits. So uh, without any further delay, here is the old footage for this video. Hope you enjoy. I was, I was pretty busy in that verse, so I'm going to step back. Keyboards, right? It's like a Rhodes thing.
B3 starts to step out here. Very cool. I just thought maybe it could use some of the old rubber bridge guitar. I'm still plugged into the deluxe reverb. So we'll see. Here we go. Once again, no click. I turned the deluxe down to six instead of seven. Thank you. 
very cool. Man. So cool though. guitar i could just sit and play it for hours anyway i'll see you later okay so you know i don't look as terrible in that video as i thought i might um that song is so cool dang it i think i did several more takes off camera as well just because it was really fun to play on so you can go like i said in the beginning of the video you can go and check out the finished product um on spotify or itunes or wherever you stream your music. Um, the artist is Kip Fox. The song is called Selfless Love. Uh, yeah, and I'm, I'm just remem reminded how much fun that record was. You know, the tracking at the studio, we tracked it at Omni. Uh, Omni is no more. <laughs> I don't know if you've heard, but that studio shut down and uh, they basically sold all the gear. Um, so... I'm curious how we're going to move forward. I mean, you know, the the scene kind of just adapts and, and makes the best that it can, you know. There's been bigger things happen um, to the music scene, and we've continued moving forward, you know. Like the, the advent of not selling the products we make, you know. I was just talking with a bunch of players yesterday over lunch. We were on lunch break for a record, and... Um, I said, could you imagine if you had done this back when we actually sold the records that we make? And everyone was kind of like, yeah. <laughs> Some of the guys that I work with, you know, they remember those days. They, they were in their heyday in the 90s. And, I mean, they were making so much more money. Just because we sold records, you know, you could make money off of a B-side, you could make money off of an album cut, um, you had special payments that were like a form of royalties, it was divided among people based on how many masters they played on, and uh, those like eclipsed the royalties we get nowadays, you know, um, nowadays we don't sell the products that we make we license them and make tiny fractions of, of a cent off of each play you know and the people who make the money these days um, are the ones who own the master you have to own the master so uh, the labels are doing well they're, they're actually doing better than they ever have ever like back when we sold records it's just that the money doesn't make its way back to the actual content creators in the same way that it used to. Um, people don't get paid on album cuts anymore. Writers don't. like they, they have to have something on the chart, and it can't just shoot to the top and ring the bell and immediately fall. It's actually better if it's a slow burn, you know? If it spends time in the top 20 or in the top 15 for weeks and weeks and weeks... Um, but the ones that climb with a bullet and then just drop like a rock, like they, they don't quite pay as well as, as the ones that spend more time up there. And I have a sneaking suspicion that we're just making less money per song nowadays anyway because we got in this mode of just saturating all of the platforms with content. You know, it's kind of what I'm doing here on YouTube. I'm adding more content, like YouTube needs more content, you know. Um, but it seems 
as, as far as songs are concerned, I wonder if we sort of went overboard during the pandemic. Everybody was home. You could have music on in the background. You could uh, check out songs. You could stream movies, whatever. Like Netflix's stock went way up and then people went back to work and then it just, you know, everyone's freaking out. And it was like, did you not see this coming? Like people are going to adjust their consumption based on getting back to being productive, right? Um, well, I feel like we're kind of experiencing that kind of correction, but I don't know if it's if it's uh, happening in the exact same way. It just feels like, and this is this is simply a guitar player speaking. I'm not a writer. I'm not a label guy. I'm not like a hardcore analytics guy of Spotify playlists and streams and how everything works, but um, just, you know, talking with other people in the scene and seeing how songs kind of last from their, you know, what their lifespan is, their arc that they're making money, it just seems like everything's like contracted now, you know? You're fighting with lots of songs, more and more and more songs for recurrent plays, you know? Uh, so it's harder to to get a particular song to make as much money now than it was probably five years ago. That's my speculative take. Um, and a huge rambling aside for the topic of this video. So anyway, I'll see you guys later. hope you have a really great day.